Hey everyone, Mitch coming in for the Compare Score Studio. Welcome to the show. So on today's episode, give in to your hate. Uh, I was kind of, actually, I was probably going to go for like a Palpatine type thing, and I really messed that up. That being said, on today's episode, we're going to be talking about the most hated cards of 2023. Now, a quick note, actually, I already did an episode on the most hated commanders of 2023, so make sure you check that one out. This one is going to be on the cards of 2023, and a slight other adjustment as well. So, with all that said, let's jump into the episode. So, on today's episode, I'm going to be using the salt scores from EDH Rec, which basically say, Hey, um, how salty does this card make you? And they do like a giant you know, basically survey to the community, and then they pull those numbers, and they say, hey, these cards are the saltiest in Commander, and they rank them. That being said, if I've edited this correctly, uh, Winter Orb should be up on the screen right now, and you won't be seeing Winter Orb in this list, even though it is the saltiest at 2.99 on the salt score, which is absurdly high, because uh, kind of when I was making this list, I decided, you know what, okay, on 2023's list, yeah, I mean, these kind of cards are always going to be there. This is like a perpetual old card that is always going to be on there. Winter Orb, I think, is from 4th edition originally. So, yeah, 1990, whatever, a long, long time ago. Maybe even before 4th edition, actually. I think it says 95 on the card. This card is an artifact for two. It says, basically, hey, everyone can only tap one land a turn, essentially. So, yeah, um, this is an absurdly... Just brutal card, and it's always going to be on there. So with this, I kind of was like, you know what? Let's talk about more modern cards. Not like cards that are in modern, but like more modern times, like the last 10 or so years. So that's how we're going to be talking about this list and kind of just like with commander cards, you know, what cards that are newer-ish are really kind of throwing a small wrench in the format that aren't just, hey, giant land destruction spells like Armageddon or cards that just like are giant stack spells because Wizards tends to not make anywhere near as many of those lately. So with all that said, let's jump into the cards in the top 20 for 2023. So, first up, with this, uh, again, slightly changed list, you know, tiered down list a little bit, we've got Force of Negation, an instant for one blue blue. If it's not your turn, you may exile a blue card from your hand rather than play a spell's mana cost. Counter target non-creature spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. Okay, basically, one of the things that tends to make these kinds of lists are cards that are seen as, well, okay, overpowered unfair or does something mean and i would say that this one is kind of like overpowered and a little unfair because when it comes to casting things and you know being tapped out players expect that they can cast their things um but no the blue mage says oh by the way i've got a free counter spell essentially that counters again just non-creature spells but here's the thing there's a reason why Essence Scatter sees, like, no play in Commander. I think that's the card that counters a creature spell for two mana, essentially one and a blue. Versus Negate, which sees an absurd amount of play. One of the most played cards out there because countering non-creature spells is incredibly impactful. Meal that for free is huge. Yeah, this $40 card, again, finished at 20th on this list with a 1.8 salt score. And believe me, it's only going to be going up from there. Because now we're at number 19 with Omniscience, which I believe was made in the last 10 or so years. I think it's, yeah, M13. There we go. 2020, 2020, 2013. So we've got a $5 enchantment that costs 10 mana in total. Yeah, even with that high of a mana value, this can still be quite salty because it says you may cast non-land cards from your hand without paying their mana cost. So when it comes to, like, overpowered, I mean, for its cost, I mean, yeah, it's a very, very, very powerful card. It does cost an absurd amount. It is a game-ending card. So I guess that's kind of the other one that might be on this list is one that can just end a game. And this definitely can. Being able to just cast spells for your hand for free is absurd. I've even built an entire deck just around this with, like, a Luna Apex of Wishes that just gets it out essentially all the time because it's the only card in the deck that is a enchantment that is actually a permanent that is not a land and so being able to just get this and then just cast everything for free yeah you can do some pretty crazy things with that this one has a 1.81 salt score so just slightly more than our last one but yeah again when it comes to why they make this list players are maybe just um yeah a bit salty when this comes down they're like oh okay um yeah i guess all your counter spells now because you're obviously in blue are free 
Great. Cool. Oh, okay. oh, you just cast that spell for retail. Oh, you just cast. Oh, great, great. Hey, cool. Hey, um, yeah, giant Eldrazi coming down. So yes, finishers like this that are massive, that are so impactful, can also make this list. Moving on, number 18, we've got Crater Hoof Behemoth. I mean, at one point this card, I think it was um, a command zone, or there was one channel out there that actually did like stats on, you know, just gathered data from games and essentially like what cards are finishing out games. And Crater Hoof Behemoth, I believe, was either toward the top of the list or at the top of the list, a 5-5 beast with haste that costs eight mana, enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain trample and get plus X plus X to have turn X the number of creatures you control. Yeah, that's a very powerful effect. This is, hey, okay, it comes into play. I win, most likely, as long as your opponents can't stop you, you know, on your attack. I mean, a, a Spore Frog could do it, I guess, you know, a Fog effect. But, uh, but typically, this is a great finisher. And again, finishers like this one can make players a bit salty, especially, again, when they see this over and over and over again as a finisher. So, yeah, if you're going against a green go-wide strategy, you know, green and white go-wide strategy... And you see this come down, you're probably not going to be surprised. Um, yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised if it was one of my decks because it's a $20 card and it's not going to fit in the budget. That being said, you can see this quite a bit and kind of get a bit salty about it because it gets kind of old. That being said, yeah, a very powerful card. And I, I do want to be honest with this one. I think this one is Avacyn Restored technically when it first came out. So it's like 2012, if uh, correct me in the comments, well, if I'm wrong on that. So I might have just extended slightly past that 10 years, but... Yeah, Crater of Behemoth, uh, there you go. Another card that is still incredibly salty. Now, moving on to 17th place at 1.85 on the salt score, we've got Overwhelming Splendor. Here we go. Aura Curse for 8 mana. Enchant player. Creatures enchant player controls lose all abilities that base power and feminist 1 1. Enchant player can't activate abilities that aren't mana abilities or loyalty abilities. Gross. Brutal. Um, yeah, just an effect that says, oh yeah, basically um, everything you're doing from here on out probably doesn't matter if it's involving your creatures, uh, because they're all just 1-1s one -ones that don't do anything. You just have vanilla creatures for the rest of the game until you actually deal with this. And if you're a creature-based strategy, this essentially just shuts you down. Versus, uh, yeah, eh, I mean, most strategies actually revolve around the commander too. And if you actually utilize this and their commander's in play, now their commander is essentially useless, and unless someone has a way to, again, get rid of this and save it, or save the commander, it just makes it so that, again, your deck might not work at all, really. Again, sure, if you're playing a strategy where you're just going wide, make a bunch of tokens or whatnot, you're like, ah, oh, whatever, fine. But even though this is eight mana, there are ways to cheat things out quite quickly. There's ways to get, you know, a specific curse on someone pretty easily. Curse misfortunes kind of thing. I think that's the one. Regardless, ways to essentially say, oh, yeah, so everyone else is playing you know, regular magic. And you, you specifically, you, who's going to get salty about this, your creatures are basically useless. So, yeah, there's a reason why this has made the salt score again. 1.85. This card used to be a lot more budget-friendly. Not quite so much now. It has been reprinted, and Wizards might not, because, again, it is so salty. Maybe we don't need it in any more decks. Moving on. Also, 1.85 salt. 16th place. I'm just doing this based on the way EDH Rec had them ranked, essentially. So, yeah, if they're tied on salt... Maybe there was like a little you know, extra digit there, you know, that they had a slight difference, but I'm just going based off of theirs, okay? You can argue in the comments if you want if one is more salty than the other, even though they're the same number. So we got to Fairy Time Raveler, a $9 card or so. Four starting loyalty to Fairy for three man total and Azorius. Each opponent can cast spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. Okay. All right, we'll keep reading. Plus one, until your next turn, you may cast source spells, though they had flash. Minus three, turn to one target artifact creature, enchant its owner's hand, draw a card. So the reason why this one is salty is not because of that minus three, not because of that plus one. It is because of that ongoing effect that says, hey, um, you're all playing at sorcery speed. I also can make it so that I can play at instant speed with sorceries, too. And that really shuts a lot of things down. No, I mean, it also shuts down just like literally any opponent who has any kind of flash cards, uh, especially flash cards. It's kind of funny. <laughs> or also instant cards, of course. Uh, and yeah, being able to say, oh, yeah, you also just literally can't counter any of my spells. You can't counter any spells I have. If I'm countering one of your spells, even on your turn, obviously you can't just instant speed cast a counter spell. It just shuts down certain strategies. It shuts down, again, being able to respond to things. And it makes it really, 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 really difficult to deal with with a deck that is built around a control shell with something like this. So, yeah, again, a 
something that kind of tips the scales on the game and again changes a crucial aspect of the game like this can definitely make players salty again especially when it is one-sided so yeah Teferi Time Raveler definitely earns that 1.85 salt score Now, moving on to 15th place, one from this year, we've got Orcish Bow Masters at 1.89 salt. A 1 1 Orc Arch with Flash that costs one and a black when it enters the battlefield. And whenever an opponent draws a card except the first one they draw on each other draws steps, it's going to deal one damage to any target that a mass orcs one. It's a $40 card. This card is absurdly powerful, and it was actually on the ban list radar before it even came out, according to the Rules Committee. It hasn't been banned, but my goodness, can this do a lot of work for you? And the way that Wizards templated this was just weird, in my opinion. Like, if they're supposed to be like, okay, so we need to create something that punishes players for drawing a lot of cards. Yeah, let's create that. Um, They didn't do that. They really didn't do that at all. What they created was a monstrosity that says, hey, again, instead of it being like, hey, it deals one damage to that player that drawed the card drew the card drawed the card <laughs> instead it's any target so you can just say oh yeah um that person's the one who's drawing like 20 cards or whatever but i'm gonna dish the damage over here so there you go being able to maybe wheel with this obviously is incredibly powerful and players can get a bit salty about decks that like to wheel again and again and again so this can just inherently do some salty things and also just a mass orcs one for no reason too on top of that really so yeah it's an incredibly powerful card again being on the overpowered scale that is definitely a reason why this is salty also again i do truly think that part of just the way that this one designed does make players salty because it really shouldn't be any target it should just be punishing the player who is drawing the cards it should not be like, yeah, just dish out to destroy that player's army over there, even though that player drew the cards. It really doesn't make any sense. So I think for all those reasons, yeah, that 1.89 salt makes sense. But now let's move on to number 14 at 1.9 salt. We've got Nexus of Fate and Instant for seven mana in total. Take an extra turn for this one. Yeah, you never see that on an instant speed spell, like ever, 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 ever. Always sorcery, essentially. It all says you put it in your grave from anywhere, reveal it, and show them to source library instead. Basically, this is an extra turn spell that well wrecked a format a while back. <laughs> and also, yeah, it can be problematic in Commander, and there are some infinite loops that you can do with this one. And when it comes to extra turn spells, that's already kind of a bit high on the well, uh, Salt Scale, just because players don't like when you monopolize the game and you essentially say like, oh yeah, I'm just playing Solitaire over here doing this again and again and again. I kind of learned that the hard way with my Joy Redact. That being said, yeah, extra turn spells like this one can come out of nowhere, obviously with that instant speed and can be used and abused because it can keep shuffling it back in and doing it again and again and again. So yeah, definitely earns that 1.90 Salt score there. A $17 card, near never gonna see it in my budget decks, but yeah, definitely a card that can make players salty. Moving on, at number 13, at 1.98 salt, we've got Void Winnower, and this weird art version of it apparently is the, um, yeah, least expensive version. Anyways, <laughs> a $25 card in 11 9 Eldrazi for 9 mana, but that's not the bad part. Your opponents can't cast spells with even mana values. Your opponents can't block with creatures with even mana values. So again, kind of like I talked about with Teferi, things that are, again, a one-sided giant benefit or a one-sided giant a detriment to your opponents this is definitely that and one that is kind of annoying to work with or around and again not random but kind of random on how much it impacts an opponent because again if your opponent just happens to have all even mana valued cards in their hand including especially things that can make them salty like removal for this like a wrath of god then they're like oh i can't cast that and i would be able to cast it to deal with it but i can't cast that also, you can't block with creatures with even mana values too. So like, oh, if you just happen to have even mana value creatures in play, you're not blocking either. So this is a card that again can shut down opponents kind of randomly. And again, is just really annoying to kind of play around or play with. It's also a card that again, although it does cost nine, there are plenty of ways to cheat things out like this or ways to get it out quicker. We'll talk about one here in a little bit, hint, hint on uh, a card that might be coming up here in the near future. But yeah, definitely a card that earns that 1.98 salt. Yeah, gross. Coming in at 12th place though, with 2.04 salt, 
We've got Narset, Parter of Veils, uh, another Planeswalker on the Salt Score, high in the Salt Score. And we'll see why, because Wizards, for whatever reason, decided, well, Planeswalkers just having activated abilities is kind of just, that's old school, that's boring. Let's give them just permanent abilities that just stay around. Five, starting loyalty Narset for three man told, each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. If that was the only thing on the card, it would not matter. This would still be exactly where it is on the salt score. On top of that, though, minus two of the top four cards your library. You may avail a non-creature, non-card from one to put in your hand, but the rest of the library in random order. Basically gets something off the top for free. Not free. I mean loyalty. But still, the problem with this card is the salty part of this card is, hey, your opponents can't draw more than one card each turn. And again, you might think, okay, if you're just starting magic, you're like, oh, okay, cool. Okay, that slows players down from trying to get too much advantage and, you know, trying to draw too many cards. Yes, but also no, because the problem is, is that this works incredibly well with, again, a type of card that some players just get salty about anyways, and that is wheels. By wheeling with this, you, again, just saying what a wheel is essentially, like, hey, everyone discards their hand and draws seven. That's like a basic wheel effect. Okay, cool. So I get to do that because I've got Narset in play and I get to still draw my seven. You all do not. You all are going to discard your hand, maybe you're already at seven, and then draw one card because you can't draw more than one each turn. And if I wheel again, you draw no cards. You are drawing no cards at all and you are all out of a hand. And then all of a sudden you're all just trying to top, top deck to try to stop me. So yeah, this can be incredibly hard to stop once you're set up properly and it's just kind of annoying to say, hey, I get all the things and you get none of the things. And yeah, again, wizards may have made some mistakes when it came to, again, making planeswalkers that maybe had some permanent effects that, you know, weren't just temporary and that uh, maybe went a little too far in certain ways. Definitely earns its, you know, points here on the salt scale. 2.04 Narset. Next up, Commander's Black Lotus with Jeweled Lotus, an artifact for zero mana. Tap Sacrifice it at three mana of any one color. Spend this mana only cast your commander. $82 or so, 2.11 on the salt scale. A card that, yeah, I mean, some players were like, that's for every deck. It is definitely not for every deck, but it can be, I'm not going to say problematic, but annoying uh, when certain decks, especially when those decks just like, oh yeah, okay, turn one Urza, ha 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 ha, game over basically. So this can essentially be a way to, again, just get your commander out absurdly quickly, really fast mana. I mean, again, get a commander that costs four out on turn one if you have it in your hand and you have a land that comes into play untapped. Again, like Urza just coming into play on turn one, basically game over because your opponents probably aren't gonna have ways to deal with it quick enough for you to get things built up enough you're just going to win. So yeah, this can just be like game over on turn one. So that is definitely a way to make players salty. And again, it's kind of, it's random, right? Because it is only one card in the 99. It can be a dead card in many games. If an opponent was to draw that later in the game, it might not help them all that much or at all, essentially. But yeah, early game, it can just be game wrecking. So that is reason why this is heavy on the salt scale. Next up, at number 10, at 2.17 on the Salt Scale, we've got Darksteel Monolith, a card that I kind of alluded to earlier. A newer card, an artifact for 8, indestructible. Once each turn, you may pay 0 rather than pay the mana cost for a color spell you cast from your hand. Now, when I was remembering this card from Spoiler Season, for whatever reason in my head, I was like, I thought it was just artifacts. It is not. And I don't think it actually would have made the Salt Scale had it just been artifact, been like, hey, yeah, pay zero for an artifact. Yes, there is still Blightsteel Colossus to worry about and many other powerful artifacts, which is a salt-inducing card. That being said, because it does say colorless, you, of course, can cheat out Eldrazi. Like, you know, Void Winterer, etc., etc. Plenty of incredible Eldrazi out there that are so powerful that you probably should have to pay mana for, but no, you're just paying zero again and again and again. And that this cannot be dealt with very easily again, having Indestructible. It makes it quite the problem. So yeah, seeing your opponent just each turn, depending on how long you survive, just cheat out Eldrazi after Eldrazi after Eldrazi with a Blightsoul Colossus then. Yeah, can be quite salt-inducing. So yeah, definitely a new, very salty card on the salt scale. 2.17 again, Darkseal Monolith. But even saltier on the salt scale, we've got the One Ring at 2.21. And 
Yeah, this is a $35 card for a reason, even though they printed like 18 million different versions of it, including the one of one ring, which is like 2.7 million or whatever it was. Um, yeah, incredibly powerful card. They definitely pushed this one. Again, they're like, okay, we really want to push Lord of the Rings. Okay, cool. So we'll make 85 Gandalfs. And also we're going to make a lot of really powerful cards, including the one ring, which, uh, yeah, it's the ring. So it's got to be incredibly powerful, right? There's a lot of things on this card that probably didn't need to be on the card, but here we go. Ledger Artifact for four that is indestructible, so again, hard to deal with. Enters the battlefield if you cast it, you gain protection from everything until your next turn. Okay, luckily they said if you cast it, so that's at least something that helps slow this card down a little bit, because you can't just blink it. That being said, you can bounce it back to your hand, replay it. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life for each bird encounter on the one ring, tap a bird encounter on it, then draw a card for each bird encounter on it. Okay. So a lot of things going on with this card. Again, even if they took off literally the first two pieces of text, essentially indestructible, then also getting protection from everything, this would still be a heavily played card and quite good. Again, card advantage and massive card advantage for any color out there, essentially, and one that can be used and abused in a couple of ways. Of course, you can, you know, proliferate to get more counters on it quicker. You can untap it to do the exact same thing and also to draw even more. And um, yeah, sure, you lose some life, but one life per card is well worth it, and you're going to be drawing probably more than one life per card. And also, yeah, you can reset it by bouncing it back to your hand, replaying it. Which, again, it incentivizes you to do because it does have that, you know, second line of text, essentially, where, hey, you gain protection from everything, so your opponents can't touch you, essentially. So, great, you just have protection. And that can be incredibly annoying to play against, especially, again, when you maybe have something that could deal with this if it was an indestructible wizard, slap that on there, too. Even though you should be able to throw it into a mountain or volcano or whatnot and melt it down, right? That, that's what you should be able to do, but you can't do that. So... The One Ring, an incredibly powerful and, again, very pushed card, it is definitely up there. Again, 2.21 on the Salt Scale for a reason. Next up, at 2.22 on the Salt Scale, just edging out our last card, we've got Opposition Agent, a 3-2 Human Rogue with Flash that costs 3 mana. You control your opponents while they're searching their libraries. <laughs> okay, so I've learned a couple things in my, you know, play of magic, and uh, controlling your opponent's turns or any of their actions, they don't necessarily like. Also, uh, hey, while opponents searching their library, they exile each card they find. You may play those cards for as long as they're in exile, you may spend mana as though or mana of any color to cast them. They also don't like when you steal things, and this also does both, right? This does both of those things. You're controlling your opponents when they're doing their actions, and it's a base action that many players do you might just think okay okay I'm, uh, my tutors are just gone okay i can't cast like demonic tutor no big deal okay well this also affects just land searching you sacrifice an evolving wilds that counts again that is searching their library any kind of land ramp which of course is very prevalent in commander with you know far seek rampant growth wayfarer's bobble how dare you shut down wayfarer's bobble yeah, that has an impact on it, too. There's more searching than you might be uh, realizing, essentially, in a game of Commander, and this shuts it down and also turns it into advantage for the player. And, of course, you can flash it in to be like, ha, 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 surprise, I get it. So, yeah, this is a card that is definitely salty for a reason. Does a lot of things opponents don't like. It, again, is very one-sided in its effect to say, let's change this aspect of the game entirely, and it all benefits me and really hurts you and doesn't let you do what you normally would want to do in a game of Commander. So, yeah, 2.22 salt definitely earned all of those salt grains. Moving on to number 7 at 2.22 salt. One that I don't think is ever going to leave this list. We've got Smothering, Tithe, and Enchantment for four mana in total. Three and a white, and we'll talk about that mana value here in a little bit. When an opponent draws a card, they may pay two. If the player doesn't, you create a treasure token. Okay, first of all, um, two is a ton. Two is an absurd amount to tax, and it's really hard for players to pay it. And when players don't, and you can't blame players for not doing so, because it completely just changes the entire game by saying... Yeah, you gotta pay two for every single card you draw. That means that you're two mana down compared to everything else per card per turn, and I'm gonna get way ahead of you. E they're gonna get an absurd amount of treasures. And treasures, wizards at first was like trying to balance things, I guess. They're like, hey, white needs treasures to help them. Here you go, you get ramp in a way. Didn't realize potentially how powerful it would be. These treasures should have came into play tapped, first of all. Secondly, again, Wizards is like, hey, this is a card that can help mono white decks. Sure, 
But also, if you're really trying to help mono white, you wouldn't just make it in a mana value that uh, any deck can play that has white. Three and a white is not a restrictive cast at all, cost at all. So if it were white, 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 for white mana, that'd be so hard for many decks to cast that they would not utilize it. That being said, it is prevalent in nearly every deck that can afford it that utilizes white because it is so overpowered. And again, every deck can incredibly easily cast it. So there's many reasons why this on the salt scale. I'm even getting salty just talking about it because the design, in my opinion, is ludicrous. Wizards, ludicrous. Because they just wanted to probably sell product and push it. Anyways. Yeah, Smothering Tide, that is an absurd card. It definitely belongs on the salt scale. I'm assuming that it's always going to be on the salt scale until they print, you know, 10 years like Smothering Tide 2.0, which only costs two mana and does the exact same thing and it taxes at four. So there, and it makes four treasures. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, a very, very, very salty card. Treasures make players salty. So yeah, 2.22, not surprising. Moving on to number six, though, also 2.22, we've got Fierce Guardianship. And yeah, just like the very first card that we talked about, if you remember all the way back to then, players don't like free counter spells. Fierce Guardianship, an instant for three mana. If you control a commander, you may cast a spell paying its mana cost, counter target non creature spell. Again, like I mentioned, just because it specifies non creature doesn't mean it's not good. Because, hey, most of the time, you just want to counter non creature spells and being able to do that for free. The vast majority of the time, because again, you're playing commander. You probably have a deck built around your commander. You probably have your commander out. And when you do, even if you're tapped out completely, it does not matter. Your opponents are going to be like, okay, I cast my spell. Yay, I'm doing things. And you're like, Haha, no, for free, I will say no. Yeah, free counter spells are kind of annoying, in my opinion. Definitely salt inducing. And uh, wizards knew what they were doing when they're pushing this one again as well. And at the very worst, this is a negate that costs just one mana more. So yeah, at, at a base level, yeah. What are you doing, wizards? Just crazy. Yeah, free counters like this one definitely going to be on this kind of a list. 2.22, fierce guardianship. You earned it. Next up. And number five, 2.40, jumping up quite a bit on the salt score. And for a reason, Dranith Magistrate, a 1-3 human wizard for two mana. Your opponents can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. What? So, okay. I mean, depending on the playgroup, this, I mean, some playgroups probably have this card banned, essentially, again, with like house rules, essentially. This, this is an absurd card in Commander that is brutally mean. Again, this is one-sided. Again, a one-sided effect that completely changes how the game works for your opponents and just makes it so that you are getting all the benefits out of that by saying, hey, you can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. And you know what? The command zone is somewhere that is not your hand, obviously. And because of that, this says, oh, you all can't play your commanders, which can shut down decks in a way until this is dealt with because many decks are just built specifically around commanders. If this were more specific, it would probably not make the list because if it was like, hey, your opponents can't cast spells from exile. So yeah, I mean, that would affect players that are casting spells from exile, you know, with like a Prosper deck, you know, working on impulse draw, casting spells from, you know, Cascade, more specific. But no, this was so incredibly broad that again, it does hit commanders. And again, it's one-sided, so it's only hitting your opponent's commanders and all their things from exile and all their other things. And it's just, oh my goodness. It is an absurd card. Again, incredibly low to the ground. Again, not hard to cast. One in a white. So any deck that is running white, if you want to start shutting things down, cool. Very easy to tutor in many ways, being a creature that is low to the ground too with low power. So um, yeah, Drath Magistrate, a gross card. Definitely worthy of the 2.40 salt scale. Moving on, a card that has kind of defined the commander format for quite a long time, Cyclonic Rift, an instant for one in a blue. Return turn target non lane permit, you can don't control to its owner's hand. Now, if that were just it, this would be a pretty terrible card. That being said, it has overload for six and a blue, meaning that if you pay seven mana at instant speed, you can just wipe your opponent's boards, everything but their lands, and you are untouched. Again, one-sided flexible board wipe or just removal if you need it. That essentially, again, out of nowhere can just be like, oh, by the way, you're all reset, and I am going to win now because I am way ahead of you all, and uh, yeah, for just seven mana, being able to wipe all your opponent's boards and keep yours around is pretty absurd instant speed. So yeah, 2.43, Cyclonic Rift, not surprising to see that 
as a very salty card on this list. Next up, at number three, at 2.5 salt on the salt scale, Wizards, what were you thinking when you designed this one? Really, like, with this and, like, Orcish Bowmasters, you're like, okay, like a two-mana creature. Let's throw everything that benefits this on the card. A 1-2 Goblin Pirate that says, When it enters the battlefield, create X treasure tokens, wrecks the number of artifacts and enchantments your opponents control. Okay, so, here's a couple of things. They could have limited this by a lot, and they chose to limit it in basically no ways. ETB. So it's an ETB that does not require a cast trigger. So again, it's not like the one ring where it's like, enter the battlefield if you cast it. No, 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 no. This does not have that. So that being said, if you blink it, and there's many ways to do so, and there's many infinite ways to do so, yeah, you can just get that effect again. Which is absurd, because for two mana, you're probably getting like 10 plus treasures at a certain point in the game, which is crazy. And also, again, this counts your opponent's artifacts and enchantments. Both. Why both? Why not just one? And also, it doesn't specify non-token. So it also counts like, hey, if you've got some treasures over there, cool, I got a treasure for each of your treasures too. So this, again, has no, no, stop, no stops on it, essentially. No requirements on it at all. It's just like, hey, everything that could go right for this card goes right for this card, and this can just be an absurd card. It is game-ending. It's also just a way to get you absurdly ahead of your opponents. Again, just getting a free 20 mana, essentially, just by playing this card and be like, oh, yeah, okay, cool, you're playing an Enchantress deck over there. You, you've got some artifacts in play. Let's get 20 mana for free you're gonna win. It's an absurd card that, again, literally has no limitations, so yeah, definitely earns that 2.5 salt score. Next up, at second place, we've got Expropriate at 2.51, just barely, barely, barely beating out Dockside Extortionist. We talked about earlier how, um, yeah, some commander players out there might get a little salty because of extra turns. Others might get salty because of you stealing things, and um, this does both. A sorcerer for nine mana. Council's Dilemma, starting with you. Each player votes for time or money. For each time, vote. Take an extra turn for this one. For each money vote, choose a permanent owned by the voter and gain control of it. Exile it. At least it exiles. Wizards, literally, thank you, Wizards, for putting that on this card. That being said, it probably does not matter. Because if you are able to take an extra turn and steal the three best things on the board, one from each opponent, you probably win 90 plus percent of the time. So this is just a, I cast this, I win the game. And yeah, the reason I say one extra turn and three steelies is that that's probably what should be done nearly every single time as well. Your opponents, if they're thinking, should be saying um, money each time. They should be saying, take one of my permanents, unless you got like a Blightsail Colossus that would just, you know, take everyone out. Basically, giving someone two extra turns is pretty absurd. So yeah, you're most likely just going to be saying extra turn yourself and then stealing things. And both things annoy commander players and make them a bit salty. So yeah. A win condition that wins in a somewhat annoying way that, of course, I mean, yeah, you could copy this. It can't be exile, or it's exile, but you could copy this on the stack. You can do a lot of other things to make sure you're getting it multiple times. Yeah, can be uh, pretty brutal and pretty effective. So 2.51 on the salt scale, expropriate definitely earns that. And finally, at first place on the salt scale, we've got 2.72 with Thassa's Oracle, a 1-3 Merfolk Wizard. In blue, blue. Enters the battlefield. Look at the top X card of your library. X is your devotion to blue. Put up to one of them in the top of your library. The rest of your library in random order. If X is greater than or equal to the number of cards in your library, you win the game. So, this is kind of like the most powerful and, in some people's opinion, worst version of Lab Maniac because it is incredibly hard to stop and it is a two card combo in many, many, many circumstances. And just, uh, yeah, can just win the game for very cheap and very easily. Like, Demonic Consultation. Okay, my library's gone. Cool, all right. Uh, this ETB is cool. I win. Cool. So, yeah, this is a card that probably gets more of the salt votes from the CEDH community. I I'm just guessing on that just because it is, like, the number one win condition, I believe. Correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on that. In the CEDH win community. Um, you might not see it as much on the casual side, but when you do, yeah, there's still going to be pretty brutal uh, win conditions from it. So, yeah, so a card that's just kind of seen in a way as, like, a more unfair win condition is not all that surprising especially one that again has been seeing a good amount of play in those communities that utilize these kinds of alternative win conditions and maybe do them in quick ways so yeah 2.72 on the salt scale that's oracle congratulations you're the saltiest card 
But now as this episode is coming to a close, it's time for me to hear from you. So in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts on this episode are. Let me know what your thoughts on these cards are. What cards didn't make the salt list this year that you think should have made it from, you know, recent years this year? Cards that you, you might get a little salty about yourself. So yeah, let me know in the comments below. And of course, as always, thanks again and have a good one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all of their support. 